Hi, my name is Oscar and I'm a scientist. Today I will talk with Abby. He's a cybersecurity expert that will tell us all about his case. He got approved in just a matter of two weeks, thanks to premium processing, and he's going to explain what was his endeavor, why it's of national importance, how he proved his well position, and he's going to offer you some very valuable tips for your EB2NIW process. If you also had a successful I-140 petition, let me know. Write me an email at oscar at eb2niw.info. We'll get in touch and we'll record a conversation like this one so we can all learn from your success. Abby, um, welcome to the channel. Uh, thank you for, for being here and congratulations on your I-140 approval. Thank you. I, I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm really happy. Yeah, so Abby and I, um, we don't know each other. Well, we just talk for five minutes now, but beyond that, we don't know each other. Um, he sent me an email through Instagram, uh, which is nice because I just opened the Instagram. So one of the first messages there. Um, and and um, for for all of you watching, you can go and, and subscribe to that new channel. And Abby, you told me that you got your approval and you are in cybersecurity. So, so can you tell me a little bit more about your background? I did my master's in cybersecurity in the US around 2016, I graduated. Um, and um, I started working early like 2017 um, in the field of uh, cybersecurity as a security engineer. Uh, I worked in a few um, San Francisco Bay Area tech companies. Um, and I got my exposure and experience there as well. Uh, and before my master's, uh, I worked briefly back in my home country, which is Nepal, uh, for a while uh, in, in the same domain. Um, so yeah, I've been working in overall field of cybersecurity for eight plus years. Um, been with different companies so far, you know, B2B companies, B2C companies, SaaS companies, but mostly tech heavy and a little bit of consulting. So you are currently on a worker visa um, you're planning to do adjustment of status, and later we're going to cover that part uh, because there are a couple of interesting things uh, of your profile. Um, but before that, let's talk a little bit more about cybersecurity from the point of view of now this this type of petition. Obviously, for for your EB2 and AW, you applied through the advanced degree route. Um, by the way, I like your profile also, and you mentioned that that you are not a PhD you don't have publications, you don't have citations. So let's talk about prong number one, cybersecurity. I I suspect um, why it's important for the US, but what did you tell USCIS um, that you, your endeavor was going to, to be, why, why is it important for the country? I think prong number one was the easiest one to prove uh, in my case, um, because there have been quite a few speeches from the president himself um, and executive orders, um, which explain um, how drastically US wants to invest or increase its investment in the area of cybersecurity. Um, I have cited a few executive orders that explicitly said that. There was also a recent bipartisan infrastructure bill uh, mm -hmm. that passed, which had significant funding for, for cybersecurity investments. Um, and, you know, combine that with President's speeches himself and uh, recent FEMA uh, policies. So, so combining all of these, it was pretty easy for me to prove that cybersecurity was in US's national interest. And as, as someone that, that doesn't work in your field at all, but as someone that does read the news, et cetera, I do know of a couple of big incidents um, related to cybersecurity. I don't know if you you did mention those at all, but m much of this legislation and, and those executive orders come from, for example, I can think of the colonial uh, pipeline attacks, right, a couple of years ago. Um, so did you mention that at all or or was just about the speeches and, and those so things? I don't think I mentioned any specific incident, um, mm -hmm. but um, you know, the it was more on a on a higher level, like cybersecurity attacks cost X billion dollars per year mm -hmm. to the government. 
same mm -hmm. for private entities and organizations. Um, companies are engaging in cyber warfare these days, and that causes this kind of losses to happen. It was it was not limited to an incident, but it was more broader in terms of how it impacts the economy, how it impacts um, national security and, and things like that. Yeah. And yeah, like you said, for you, it was kind of easy to prove that because we all know how how important these things are. And I like how you mentioned specifically the dollar amounts um, because UCIS does like to see numbers you know and, and not only vague statements but uh, they particularly like money <laughs> like much of the u.s uh, culture is is about money capi capitalism and and so on so you do you do well when you put uh, a tag number there that says you know millions of dollars lost etc et i got those information from very reliable sources like you know data.gov and uh, you know data published by government entities like i prioritized them heavily because i had a feeling and my lawyers also um said the same thing that uscis tends to trust higher um give, tends to give higher weight to the to the references or sources that are published by government and uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's subsidiaries yeah yeah anything that has a dot gov at the end it's um i always say that's the the priority number one then you can go to other types of sources but dot gov is is the best exactly so let's move to um prong number two why you are well positioned so your endeavor was related to cybersecurity. why you why usas should trust you abby to take this into your hands and benefit the us regarding this i think I claimed to be a person with advanced degree and extraordinary ability to your earlier point, I think you briefly mentioned there. So to claim the second thing, to claim the second aspect, I think I had a few items that I'd worked on uh, earlier in my career before I actually started working in the industry itself. So that included things like do, uh, participating in in these competitions called Capture the Flags, which is specific to cybersecurity, uh, participating in um, uh, you know uh, vulnerability grant programs that other private companies um, provide. So I had a few things. Uh, one of them was a blog write-up that I did on a vulnerability that I found, which happened to be picked up by some of the news media, uh, like Business Insider. It was pure luck, like you know, that was it wasn't even that special in in my honest opinions. But uh, you know, some news media, like it was in Yahoo News and business media, which made it easier for me to say that my work has been recognized by peers, mm -hmm. government entities, or business organization. So mm -hmm. like that that prong was met by me publishing those vulnerabilities in my own blog and being covered in in other places. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I've also published several vulnerabilities that are listed in national vulnerability database that okay. that is also a, a gov, .gov website. So I think that kind of helps as um, as the kind of source that they want to see. So having published these vulnerabilities and being recognized for these was one of those. Uh, the, the one of the I think they have six you you, you six or ten yeah. I, I do that yeah. but. So, so I'm, I was trying to see how much I can fit into one of those, mm -hmm. right? So I fit into one by um, by mentioning that I have these book, these not publications, but you know, vulnerability write-ups uh, is yeah. is a better term, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess the second thing is um, higher salary uh, was one thing that I used to. So I'm well positioned. Mm -hmm. um, salaries in Bay Area in tech are slightly higher than than everywhere else but of course you compare yourself to the peers um uh, mm -hmm. so so my lawyers used uh something like a salary.com or like a publicly available salary information and so mm -hmm. what the low end was what the high end was what the median was and so that i was making significantly more than the the numbers that are out there so i use that to my advantage um third thing obviously was the master's degree in the specific area of cybersecurity. Uh, which is like uh, also another point that you can add 
because mm-hmm. to solve sustainability. I don't yeah. have 10 years of full time working experience, so I couldn't use that. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, I think I had another certification uh, mm-hmm. in the area of cybersecurity, which made my lawyers argue that I met at least four of those mm-hmm. uh, those six or ten, however many subjective points about you know me meeting exceptional ability in that area as well. So, so I like that because you know you didn't need exceptional ability for. Um, fulfilling that general EB2 requirement because you did have advanced degree, but but because you you do meet some of these criteria, then you use them to fulfill the prong number two, showing that obviously if you are an exceptional individual, you are well positioned too. So exactly. so it's a smart way of of using all that evidence and present it in a way that shows them, okay, guys, uh, in USAS, if if for you. A person of exceptional ability has these things, and I do have them. Then I'm well positioned. And the second thing you said is the the remuneration or or salary, which is used in the EB1 category as one of the criteria for EB1, which is a higher standard. So if you meet a, a criteria from a higher standard, that also puts you um, in the category of of well positioned individuals. So so I think that's a smart thing, and and. And like you said, you have to prove it. It's not just about saying, well, I earn a lot of money. You have to show how much you earn and how much your peers earn, which you mentioned. So that's exactly. uh, that's very good. Uh, so lawyers, you, you talk about lawyers. Um, how was your experience with lawyers? Were you happy with the experience? Uh, do you recommend working with lawyers? Lawyers, in my experience, what they basically do is they have this template that they want you to fill out. Mm-hmm. So instead of you filling out the I-140 form and having a free form blank A4 paper where you have to actually write down everything in the petition, they basically give you a set of questions that they can plug into these, mm-hmm. these paragraphs. So, mm-hmm. the, so in the end, you do the work yourself. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you know your profile the best, you know your ideas the best. Having mm-hmm. said that, it's a lot of work. Like, if you can delegate some of that, and if you have uh, enough money to, mm-hmm. to spend, it's probably nice. If you mm-hmm. have the time and if you have the drive to to do it yourself, I think, you know, I would. It's it's a very personal decision at that point. I I don't think um, I would have if I was short on money and if I had enough time, I would probably. Uh, do it myself because I did the work myself, most mm-hmm. of the work myself. Uh, you, you spend a lot of hours, right? Yeah, uh, exactly. Writing stuff for the lawyers. Exactly. So you write your own proposed endeavor. Uh, they basically tell you what to write in each paragraph, but mm-hmm. you actually do write yourself. Yeah. So yeah. And then they probably do a job of editorial and maybe like fixing grammatical mistakes, but you know, that's that's the extent of it because they're not the experts in in the area that i work in and they can't really elaborate on the skills that i have it's more having a second person to review what you wrote and making sure it the petition as a whole makes sense but i think i could have done that myself if i had enough time i was working full time uh, and like you say sometimes it's like working another full time for at least three months or something you know, yeah. to preparing all these petitions. So it's, it's definitely like another job, or for people that that did their PhD, or you you did your masters. I don't know if you did a masters with thesis or non thesis, but if you work on a thesis, this is kind of similar than than working on a on an academic thesis. Yeah, I could totally see like it being like just like preparing a paper, conference paper, and from scratch, you know, like mm-hmm. collecting the evidence to to making that argument and actually submitting it yeah yeah but yeah you're totally right like lawyers i think um you can you can find good lawyers you can find not so good lawyers but eventually you will have to do all the work for them they will do the final touches and they know some ins and outs from ucis but at the end of the day nobody should think that because you're hiring a lawyer and spending a lot of money that you're not going to do anything because you're right. You know your profile the best. So, 
<laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I would be worried if it wasn't that way also, because these people, how are they going to write a good petition if, if they don't really know you? Yeah, exactly, yes. I think when we pay lawyers, we're paying them for more of a the, that coveted knowledge they have about past experience they have. It's not as much about helping me directly. It's more about they know what it takes to get approved and what kind of language really sounds pleasant in USCIS personnel side. And I think that's what we're paying the lawyers for, not not for actually preparing the petition in, in the best way possible. That's you know that you think it's is the is the best way to put your foot forward. Yeah. So I actually forgot about one thing related to prong number two and prong number one, uh, and, it, and that is um, if you had a professional plan or a business plan uh, for your petition. I did, yeah. So I had a, first of all, I had a proposed endeavor and within that I had a business plan uh, written down. So mm -hmm. my business plan w was revolved around my proposed endeavor, of course. So, you know, my proposed endeavor was to discover and research new classes of vulnerabilities and suggest fixes for them like something along those lines right and this this requires years worth of work decade, decades worth of work right and and my business plan or plan for the future included things like me continuing to work on personal development continuing to attend conferences which i've done in the past continuing to present in conferences, which I've done in the past as well, continuing to build my personal brand through you know, personal websites, through expanded uh, connections, and uh, offering my services on a contract basis to, to you know, government entities or uh, business organizations uh, on a one-off basis, where I can actually work on, you know, discovering and helping resolve classes of issues, not be limited in impact to just one organization or one mm -hmm. uh, entity. So like that basically helps me say why I want an EB2 and IW instead of just being in H1B. Um, yeah. And that also tells that my work has a broad impact mm -hmm. instead of, instead of you know, limited to being, being one organization or, or you know, one nation. In fact, it's a it's an endeavor that actually um, would help any country uh, or any everywhere in this in this particular industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you use the the phrase broad impact, and that is a phrase that USAS loves, and that I see in a lot of RFEs from people that I that that they contact me for uh, that they are looking for help with their RFEs. Um, I see that expression a lot. They want to see that what you do impacts beyond your circle, beyond your company. And I think the way you put it makes total sense. You provide some services, so that way you are reaching farther, you know, and globally. I, I think it should also make sense in, in terms that your your trajectory, like where you are starting from, it should match where you are. It cannot just be high flying from the point that, that you apply. It should have some baseline, but you can kind of shoot for the stars uh, mm -hmm. for what you want to do in the future. Mine wasn't very ambitious in that a lot of it are the things that I've already done in the past, but I think you know that's something uh, anybody else applying could, could think about. and. Uh, and broad impact, it, it's not right now, it's it's in the future, so you can dream big, right? So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it has to be realistic, uh, and USAS doesn't, uh, will, will not come back to you next year and will ask you where are you with the plan. However, it has to be realistic enough that they believe that, that you can do it and that you actually plan to do it. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, that's great. Thank you for for providing that insight on on your case. Um, now let's talk about a big issue that we are seeing in the last weeks, which is adjusting status in the U.S. So you uh, applied from within the U.S. So your second part of the process is adjustment of status, not consular processing. We are seeing that uh, the visa bulletin is 
creating some issues for those uh, of you who are applying from from the US right now, but it will eventually impact everyone because the lines are getting bigger. People cannot do concurrent applications, but your case is different. I, I know that. So tell me a little bit what makes your case a little bit special. So I recently got my NIW approved um, and I filed I-140 and I-485 concurrent. Whenever I tell that to people, uh, you know, they immediately jump to conclusions and say, oh, this person is probably lying. Like, he, or, or you he, don't know what you're doing. What yeah, you exactly. Doing? You don't know what you're doing. And uh, and I have to like explain a, a fair bit so I understand the confusion there. Um, so my employer-based EB2 petition was approved with an employer that I worked for in the past. And I one forty application was approved, you know, which went through the regular perm processing, regular PWD processing. By the way, perm and PWD processes are very backlogged now as well. Like when I got my I one forty approved with employer, it took me like ten months. Now just the perm process is taking ten months, and the PWD process is taking about six months. So that entire process, wow. I think, has almost doubled in time. You can port your priority date, which is an official word. I, I don't think USCIS uses that. So you can retain your priority date from uh, past if your I-140 was approved. So my I-140 date was, I-140 priority date was um, sometimes in 2018. So uh, even if the visa bulletin doesn't show that rest of world, it, it's not current. As of now, I can still use that uh, old priority date to file my adjustment of status based on the new NIW petition that was recently approved. Mm -hmm. uh, this is something that you know my lawyers confirm as well. Uh, so I'm hoping USCIS will educate my application according. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe it would take a little bit of time for them to realize, but but yes, they they should because this is a thing that actually exists. Um, I like that that you're in that situation, so we can have a little bit of a different story in your case. And and also it will help others that maybe uh, they may be on a, on a similar path also. But a word of, of caution to people, you cannot do this if you have a priority date from a family-based green card. It has to be an employment-based uh, green card. Um, you cannot switch from employment to, to family. Because I know that there are uh, a lot of people waiting for family-based green cards. Unfortunately, you cannot do that. Those come from two different buckets. Nice. But um, but yeah, uh, congratulations uh, twice now because you not only got your I-140, but you're going to have uh, an adjustment of status that is pretty fast. And, and soon you should get into that um, process and, and get your EAD card, your travel document, etc. So, so that's awesome. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, I I'm not sure what the processing time looks like in 2023. In 2022, for employment based, it was super fast. A lot of my friends got their green cards in like four, five, six months from the time of I-140 filing. Um, I'm not sure what it's gonna look like in 2023, but hopefully the processing times keep getting better. Yeah, I hope so. I think uh, that's the trend right now. I hope that's the case. They are they are hiring a lot of people, so I do hope that those things go fast. What doesn't go fast is anything related to the visa bulletin because that doesn't depend on UCIS. It depends on on the number of visas that Congress allows them to use. So um, it's yeah. it's kind of crazy how EB two retrogressed, but EB three is current. Like it's you know it retrogressed about almost a year and then the other other category is just current yeah yeah and uh, yeah that's uh unfortunately like like i usually say is one of those things out of our control even out of ucis's control so uh the only hope for people is that at some point congress will have some um <laughs> some action on that sense but we all know that uh congress and senate and those institutions they are not known by their speed and and their willingness to to do things that benefit um, most immigrants so i have my doubts that that will happen unfortunately i agree yeah that seems yeah. like the direction we're headed 
So my last question, and then and then you tell me if, if we need to cover anything else. My last question is, how did you educate yourself? I know um, in this topic of NIW, I know that you, you do follow uh, this channel, um, but what resources did you use or, or how did you find this particular channel um, useful to you? I used uh, quite a few resources, including the USCIS's website itself. Like it had these um, these criteria for exceptional ability um, that I saw, right? And and I wanted to see if I could actually meet at least three of them. And I felt like I would meet three of them. Uh, first of all, that's where my search or like that's where I started the, the entire process. I started thinking this might be worthwhile investment of time and money um, because I do seem to meet some of those criteria. So USCIS's website was my starting point, first of all. Um, second, after that, um, I somehow found like past denied cases of, uh, read some of the denied cases to see. You actually made a video on that, but yeah. I, you know, I, I was actually finding those those cases from AAO, Administrative Appeals Office, mm -hmm. I think, um, mm -hmm. that actually USCIS publishes and, and seeing like, if there are hints or if I are things that I can avoid in my own application, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that could mean like lack of evidence or being too vague or not uh, uh, not having an endeavor with a broader impact. So, so things mm -hmm. like that, right? Yeah, uh, you want to learn from somebody else's mistake. That's exactly. what I say. <laughs> so yeah, those, those few things uh, I, I looked at early. Uh, USCIS website, it, it's not the most user friendly though. Like, you know, finding this information kind of takes time and sometimes there's legal jargon involved right mm -hmm. um so like chat gpt came out actually i use that as a as yeah. a, as a very helpful resource like i like to uh, uh, process information in a way that's that's consumable to me right like so i actually use that to to kind of understand and i even asked it question like it was my own lawyer so it would always say <laughs> as a as a language model i can't answer this or that but you know, yeah, generally, yeah. generally, I use that as a resource. It's basically in yeah. And, and, and by the way, you can also use it to to do research on what topics are of national importance, what kind of legislation you can find. Uh, it's very useful. I I also uh, use ChatGPT. <laughs> it is. I, I I used a little bit of it on actually doing that. With the thing that you just mentioned, like finding the exact um, uh, executive orders, but it just doesn't have data from since 2021 so you have to do some of your own research on your own uh, so that was my second resource third of course your your um, youtube channels were super helpful i've um i was scrolling through your channel the other day and i feel like i've watched every single one of your videos and like <laughs> i had that red completion notice and all of them so of course <laughs> your, your channel was super helpful uh, in understanding uh, everything i was asking more questions to my lawyers about completeness or lack thereof on the on the application because I looked at you know your channels as an example you have to submit a labor certification form and i think you recommended one and i you know i asked lawyers about why not the other one because it seems like the the 750b is going to expire at some some point so so you know i was i was uh, gathering data points trying to do my own research and cross verifying uh, the information that was given to me with the information that i that I got from your website, USCIS website, and, and other places. So I think this was this was pretty pretty good. There were there are a few groups in Facebook that work as a resource group or even Reddit, where people post their profiles on approved cases. And I think that's super useful because lawyers don't typically share that kind of information. Mm. I also actually I also asked a few lawyers. I, I have an interesting story that I want to kind of share. Uh, not really. Not really interesting, but like you know, I, I found that majority of lawyers want wouldn't want to take you if you don't fit a bunch of checklists that they have, and that yeah. sometimes that includes uh, publications and citations. Mm -hmm. So they want to do the least amount of work, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, you know they want to take cases that they think are you know USCIS is clearly going to approve, and. Mm -hmm. In that case, I think, why do they even need a lawyer? So, you know, like there, there's probably a, a higher chances for them to just do self petition and get a yeah. but, um, but I, I, I digress going in that direction. Generally, um, generally, I, I think lawyers give out free evaluation reports, and I think that's kind of helpful as well. 
early in the process. So that's another resource talking about, you know, what resources I use. I, I ask for lawyers uh, and they ask questions uh, like on some form or something and they tell you the whether you think they're uh, you're going to you're likely going to be approved. But they have again the questions are also template. They don't really try to understand entirety of your profile in those questions if you provide as much information as you can and try to see what lawyers have to say about you. I think that could be a valuable resource early on. You might decide not to hire them, but they do provide the service for free before you even hire them. So yeah. I think this uh, is something that you can take advantage of. Uh, yeah, no, no, that, that's a, an interesting tip uh, to give to people, especially early, like you said, early on in the process. Uh, it's something that it's free. Why or why not take advantage of that? Then you can choose one of those, but but you are still shopping for lawyers at that point. But the the flip side of story is that you might get discouraged because a lot of them will soon say no <laughs> because the ones that give you this free service will they are known to take only cases that already have a high chances of approval. So don't get discouraged. Uh, I got said no by a couple of really well known firms um, as well, but you know it was it was because they didn't want to do um, yeah. a lot of work for me because my case is kind of non conventional for yeah. for what they what they usually see. Yeah, you are not an academic, so so when they see that kind of profile, they are like, well, I mean, it. it what I always say is that it goes to um, demand uh, versus uh, how do you say um, offer and demand, right? There's too much demand right now of people that want a lawyer, people that need help, so they have a lot of work. They can um, they can just pick and choose the profiles that they prefer and like you said maybe the academic profile is better because they have their templates it fits very well their templates they have their arguments made and they just go with that and that's it and your case is a little bit different so they have to put a little bit extra effort so but i like your tip don't get discouraged exactly yeah if if lawyers say no it just they don't want to do the work there it, or it it might actually be you might have to do a self honest look and say probably now is not the not the right time if you're giving a lot of this advice from from everywhere but you know don't get discouraged from one two or three data points that you see um just because the lawyers say no it's it's the only person that you can that can decide whether you are qualified or not is the uscis officer like you always say yeah yeah awesome um Cool. I, I think the the question was not about advice, but but I got a lot of advice here. So so thank you for that. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it just I boils into that. Today. Sorry. No, no, that's awesome. Uh, because I mean, this is about helping other people. So I think this is valuable. So anything else that that we didn't cover today that you want to share with people that you want to maybe some other advice? I don't know if we left something um, off the table. I, I see a lot of self petitioners. You know. Um, who might not be uh, qualified at this time, but could qualify if they work on their profile and you know, uh, a year down the line, they might have have ac actually profile that's uh, seriously worth considering, right? If they're in that path, in that direction already. I think really look at what it means to prove the second prong. Um, and you know, that for me, it came from proving exceptional ability. So if you you know try to meet more of those those criteria that are out there and see how you can meet them in your field, that could really be helpful. Um, and even if now is not the best time, you can work you know towards meeting them in the future and and start thinking about um, applying it uh, in long term or, or medium term. You know, so yeah. you don't get discouraged even if you don't uh, if you, even if you feel like uh you don't meet all the all the criteria uh, as you know now and and if there's something that you can work on like exactly I, mean, yeah. I, I like that that you can work on your profile you can do things depending on your field it will be something here or something over there but for scientists you can publish more you can wait to get more citations for non-scientists you can work on projects that are very relevant. You can be a member of societies that require certain uh, characteristics and they are not just about paying fees. So you have to be creative. And like you said, um, sometimes this is a plan that is not an immediate plan. It, it, it is five years down the line, but you have to use those five years to strengthen your profile. 
Thanks, Neil. Yeah. yeah, it takes time, not just to prepare the application, but also to prepare your own profile. It takes even mm-hmm. longer time for that, actually. Um, but you know, it's it's part of the process, and I think I think it's it's really great that we have this option in the in the first place, like to to get past all that uh, lever certification job offer PWD, mm-hmm. which is excruciatingly long process. And, and now if you were to stick with an employer, it takes at least three years or, or more to, to mm-hmm. get a green card. Um, you know, if you're going through the traditional uh, EB2 route and, yeah. you know, with all these layoffs happening, I think you made a video on that as well. Uh, mm-hmm. I think this is a good route for people to take uh, as well if they qualify for it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Avi, I don't want to take more of your time. So um, I thank you for for this conversation that I think is going to be very, very helpful for people. And and good luck to you, not not just in your in your EB2 and IW process, which hopefully will come to an end relatively soon, but in your life uh, in the US, in your cybersecurity endeavor, and in everything good that is about to happen to you. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. I enjoyed the conversation as well. Thanks, Oscar. Thank you. If you also want to be successful in this EB2 NAW category, you should visit my website, eb2naw.info, where you can find a lot of resources and they will help you in this journey of petitioning. I'm very proud of my EB2 NAW course because it will include my I140 successful petition, my adjustment of status package, my ebook some examples of how to put together a professional plan, and I will go step by step in a series of lectures, both in English and in Spanish, in how to fulfill these requirements for NIW, how to craft solid recommendation letters, how to put together a successful cover letter for your case. In essence, you will find everything you need to know in this EB2 NIW green card process. I'm also in Instagram. So if you want to follow me, I'm at Oscar's Green Card and you can join me there and I will have a better communication with you so I can let you know of everything related to NIW and also of EB1 categories, those categories in which you can self-petition. And as usual, I want to thank you for your support. I want to thank you for being there, for subscribing, for sharing these videos, and I wish you good luck in your EB2 NIW Green Card journey.